So we saw that at this point the, the text is too close to the edge and previously I said that CSS operates with under the box model which is there's basically a box that controls everything there's everything on your screen is in a box it's the box model and there's always four sides the top the right the bottom and the left even if it's invisible there's a box covering this at the moment but it's invisible we made the box appear around the h1 by putting a background color and this shows that uh, there's very little bit of edge in that box so we're going to affect uh, the in this case the padding so I'm going to further add another property to my selector here, padding, colon, space, 25px. This is one of the spots that I said that the spacing does matter, actually. You do not want a space between your, uh, between your value and your unit, 25px, 25 pixels. You don't want a space there. But as normal, I do have a space padding, colon, space, so the... Uh, property and the value. I do have a space there, but actually I don't need a space there. I could have written it also like that. It's just I think it's, it's too jumbled up and a little harder to read. But I would add a space between the property and the value, but I would not add a space between the the actual uh, uh, value and the units, because that might not work depending on the kind of CSS rule you're writing. This would actually confuse things, so no space there. And the result of that is now I've got 25 pixels of padding of space inside of the box. So 25 on all four sides of this box. The right side is a special case because it automatically goes all the way to the right unless we tell it otherwise. There are all of these default built-in behaviors that we can override via CSS and JavaScript. But notice 25 pixels all the way around the four sides of the box. The reason we don't want spaces is because we can control all four sides of that box independently. Let's do this. Let's instead of simply saying 25px, let's say 25px space, um, 45px space, 55px space and um, 65 px four values this is why spaces matter here you don't know what this will look like just yet perhaps so save it and run it let's see what that looks like why am I putting so many numbers here save it and run it <clears throat> T R B L. T R B L. Top, right, bottom, left. I'm controlling the four sides of this box. The top side, the right side, the bottom side, the left side, in that order. That's the rule. Top, right, bottom, left. Hey, that's perfect for me to write a comment there. I might want to remember that. Top, right, bottom, left. So in this case I'm affecting the padding of the four sides of the box. First the top space, then the right space, then the bottom space, then the left. And so you'll see I've got different amounts of empty space inside of that box. By only writing one value it then pretty much put the one value, 25 pixels, on all four sides. But if I specifically mention those four sides, it will obey and put it on those four sides. So the shorthand is a, is a single value. I could do this also. I could do uh, 55px and 25px. Remember the order, the cascade. I wrote two uh, padding properties. They're going to fight it out, and this one's going to win because it came out second. It came out later. 
So first we said, let's make our padding like that. And they said, actually, let's make it like this. So it obeyed the last one. And actually now what I've got here is a brand new padding of 55 and 25. Well, if I use a shorthand of a single value, it will apply it to all four sides. But if I use the shorthand of two values, it's going to take the first value and apply it to the top and bottom equally. And the second value is going to apply it to the left and right equally. In that case, it would be top and bottom. I suppose technically right and left. So two values. The first one always applies to the top and bottom equally. The second value always to the left and right equally. Four values, top, right, bottom, left. one value, all sides. You can put in three also, I forget what that does exactly. You usually don't put three. You usually either put all four, or two or one. And so here we've affected the padding and one more time, and then now it's only five pixels. So the cascade is basically top to bottom. So the last rule is the latest rule that takes the precedence. When you've got more than one of the same property that is affecting a selector. Okay, so before we go further with CSS, let's do something down here. Let's go into our main body section. We've got a div that says, this is a div, we'll style it with CSS. I want to write another div and write something else inside of it. So uh, after your, your div, before the end of body, let's create another div block. Now like this is a second div. Just write some content on a second div. I'm just I'm going to show you something in a, in a moment, but I want two divs, two blocks of content. <clears throat> What's that? Well, it's at approximately line 35, but it's before the end of your body, before your comments start down there. So back up on our embedded CSS, we've written a selector so far to affect the whole body of the document. We've written a selector to affect the... Um, the heading one. We can also write selectors to affect paragraphs, ordered lists, list items, and divs. So let's go back to our CSS and uh, we'll write a selector to affect these divs. I'm going to back up to my style section. So notice Notepad um, if you click at the end of, a, of this curly brace, it highlights red, and it goes back, red dotted line, to tell you it started there. Or it might also show you here on the left side. So that's, that's the mark of any code editor, or IDE. It uh, lets you edit your code in a civilized way. If we were using something plain, like just plain old Windows Notepad, it would just be a, a big wall of black and white text, very hard to deal with. But any editor 
like Notepad++, Sublime Text, Text Editor, Eclipse, etc., etc., should have ways to make writing code easier, like little flourishes like that. So this is just telling me that this is where my heading 1 selector ends. That's at about line 18 before the end of my style declaration. So press Enter. We'll create a brand new selector called div. So here I'm going to say those divs, we are going to select them, basically, and change them. So same syntax, curly braces, and we will add a background color again. I'm not going to say anything about a text color yet, but what I will do is add a border-radius, a little roundedness, to that box. So this is on lines, this is on lines 19 or so before the end of style. We're going to create a new selector here to select and to define, to redefine the look of the divs. Save it and run it. You should get a background, a yellow color behind the, the text at the bottom. And a rounded rounded edges. That was border radius. We saw that previously. We saw that instead of having straight 90 degree angles at the end at the edges of the box, in this case I'm giving 25 pixels of roundness to the four to the four corners. Because there's always a box. Yes? Uh, I was wondering how we would uh, separate the first div from the second div. Like, let's say this one is a box of your own first div. How would I close that? That's what we're getting to. Okay. You might have noticed here that this color applied to both divs. Maybe I only wanted it to apply it to one div. We're, we're going to get to that very soon. But this is, this, is what the, this is what we'll see with CSS. One of the good things, one of the bad things, that here, I was not specific enough. This div is going to, this, this selector is going to apply to all divs in my document. So if I had 10 divs, they would all be defined this way. They would all get a yellow background. I probably don't want that for all 10 of my divs. Maybe I want that for two of them. And the other uh, eight, I want them to be defined differently. So we'll get to that very soon. But before that, I think this this is too close together. It's uh, it's kind of a uh, kind of looks odd. I want a little bit of space between them. So um, on the previous selector, we added some padding, and the padding will give us space inside of the box. What was that other thing that we can do to give us space outside of the box? Margin. Margin. So we'll say, okay, we've got a background color, we've got a border radius, some roundness. Next line, we'll say uh, margin, and we'll just give same amount on all sides, so one value. Let's do 15 pixels to start off with. There we go, so now they're not touching anymore. This put 15 pixels at the top, right, bottom, left of this div and that div, so there's about 30 pixels in total there. 15 from this one, 15 from this one. And I also think the, the text is way too close to the edge. You see on my roundness, the T is kind of falling out of that color. So I can also put in some padding. Uh, let's see what it looks like with also another 15 pixels. Yeah, that looks, that looks good. So hopefully here you're seeing the power of CSS. We are defining a selector to control things on screen. We can add multiple... Uh, properties and values to the selector to define it and control it and style it in a variety of ways. That's the whole point, as we saw on our notes down there. HTML is for the is the is the content layer. Uh, CSS is the presentation layer, and later we'll deal with JavaScript. But here now we're changing the presentation. <clears throat> some colors, some uh, some spacing and margins and so forth. Okay, so notice I didn't say anything about a text color in my div, and it's red. 
well, on my rules previously up here, I had said that my body text is red. The div elements are inside of the body element, literally, we see here. There's the body tag, and that, the red line shows me that it, that's encompassing everything, including these divs. So therefore, the CSS rule that I wrote for a body, red color, trickles down to everything inside of the body, except where else we override that, such as h1, and we said make that text color pink, and it did it. Since we didn't say anything about a text color in div, it automatically inherited the color of the body. It's kind of like the Russian nesting dolls. You've got a big doll, open that up, you've got a little doll. You open that up, you've got a literal or little, 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 little doll. Inside of that one, you've got a literal or little, little doll. So, more little doll. So, the same sort of thing here. Elements or tags inside of tags. Uh, proper, uh, elements inside of elements are going to inherit the top elements CSS down, unless we uh, override it. And so what I want to do here is, um, I've got two divs, but I want to style them differently. One to be yellow and red, and one to be uh, black and white, let's say. We need to be more specific. This is very general. All divs will look like this. And here's the way how we can be specific. We're going to introduce the concept of, of, um, of IDs and classes. I'm going to make a note down here, back on my notes section. <clears throat> we have three kinds of CSS. New section. Um, the three kinds of CSS selectors. We have tag, class, and ID. We can create a CSS rule. We can define a selector for a tag, which basically redefines the look of an existing tag. We wrote the body selector, and we changed how it looked. We wrote the heading 1 selector, we changed how it looked. We wrote the div selector, we changed how it looked. So tags redefine the look of existing um, tags. We've also got classes and IDs. Uh, so classes basically uh, let us invent new tags. This is not the best definition, but it'll make sense and it will refine it. Classes let us invent tags. So we have currently the div tag, the body tag, the ul tag, etc., etc. You can kind of invent tags and then target those new tags with new rules. And another thing about that is that you can use these, or can be used, multiple times. Because, in contrast, IDs also let us invent new tags, can only be used once. And um, I'll write it in a moment, but this is, can only be, can be used multiple times per document. IDs can only be used once per document. Mm -hmm. 
So tags are these elements that already exist, that were invented in 1989 and on, that are built into the HTML language. Classes and IDs are those that we can invent ourselves and use them for our own purposes. The difference is classes can be used multiple times per document and IDs can only be used once per document. So the way we, we would use or create a class or an ID is like this. Let's back up to where we've got our our first div tags and we're going to add a property here so we've added properties like we added a property up here for meta remember a property is is some code inside of a tag um, we're going to add a property to the first div so inside of that div tag between the v and the angle bracket space inside that tag we're going to add a property I'm sorry we're going to add an attribute an attribute an attribute is inside of a tag uh, and this attribute will be class equals quote end quote um, same sort of syntax as the meta tag you see we've got the tag meta and inside we've got an attribute which in that case was car set equals quote end quote here we've got a, um, an attribute called class, and we're adding it to div. And inside, we're going to say, let's call this first div. We're kind of inventing a tag here. It's a class. So we're inventing a tag called first div. Do you notice that I've written a capital letter D? Because I'm inventing it, I can call it just about anything I want. But if I were to call this capital first space div, that would actually be a problem. The rules are, uh, I said this previously, I haven't said it today, but most of the time we're going to be writing everything in, in lowercase. HTML5, the standard is that it's lowercase. But the, um, the, the special case is when we're writing our own classes, when we're inventing our own classes or IDs. If we want to, we could call this first div, all lowercase like this, or first capital div like that. Both of those will work, but the thing is that we have to refer to them throughout our code exactly as how we wrote it the first time, exactly as how we defined it. So if I write this first div with a capital D, and in other parts of my code I would try to refer to it as first lowercase d, things might not work. So you do want to keep it consistent. If that sounds confusing, it's fine to keep it all lowercase. That's going to be better, because you're not going to need to remember, did I put uppercase here or lowercase? As you get used to this, though, and you look at people's code and tutorials and such, oftentimes it's using this method. Because we cannot use spaces here, for it to be readable, people put in what, are, what, is, off, what is known alternately as camel caps or intercaps because I could have called this my first div that would work and with these two capital letters they, they kind of look like humps on a camel see programmers are funny camel caps there's the hump on the camel or that's why it's also called intercaps they're capital letters inter or inside of a of an element my first div Um, capital F. Uh, I believe the, the, the rules here are that that's not recommended, so you can use capital letters, but not on the first letter. Inside of it should work, but no spaces between your words, because technically that's two different classes. So I'm going to call this first div with a capital D. Yes? You can't use number D between the one that's T. That's right. Um, you can use numbers, but I believe they cannot be the first item. 
the, in, in the first position. So if you wanted to call this one first div, I don't believe that's valid. But if you call this first div one, that should work. So there's these weird rules, but really to simplify it, perhaps you know keep it all lowercase and avoid numbers. Um, if you are going to use numbers, because sometimes you do need numbers, you would want to put it at the end. And you would avoid putting a number at the beginning or a capital letter at the beginning. So usually I'm going to write something like this. I'm going to write the lowercase. If I need to write more than one word, I'm going to write the, the first word lowercase and the second word with an uppercase. And if we need three words, my first div, I would do the first word, my, lowercase, the second word, first, uppercase, and the third word, div, uppercase. That's how uh, oftentimes you see tutorials and examples, and the book mentions it like this, and many uh, programmers do it this way. So the point of this is um, I'm, I'm writing a class here called first div. The point of this is that now I can write some CSS that will specify, that will target only this div, not all divs, just this div. I've written a class that, will, uh, that I can write a selector for that will target only this div. And the way we write it is, let's go back to our CSS at the top. We've written this rule, we've written this selector for all divs after the div up on your style section, press enter, and now we're going to say, okay, let's target just first div. And because it's a class, we have to use the syntax dot, just the period, full stop, first div. And then the rest is the same. That's the big trick there. Because we said class equals whatever we want, in the CSS we have to say dot whatever we wrote. That is what means shorthand, basically, class. And it is that way. You have to do it that way. Down here in your HTML, you call it class equals something. And then in your CSS, you have to use the dot. Confusingly, you don't use the dot down here. I did not write a dot there. Don't write a dot there. That won't work. So think about this class equals being turned into a shorthand of the dot. <clears throat> and now I can do what I want here. Background color, purple. So all divs were first background yellow, and now any div that is also that also has the property that has the class first div um, will get a purple background. Does that work for everyone? Does anyone uh, need a little help? <coughs> So my first div has a purple color there, still the same red color of text because it inherited it from the, the larger element, the containing element of the body, not simply because it's in that order. I could have written the body selector last, but it's because also the which takes precedence does have different dimensions. It is in, a, it is in about the order that it's written, but it also is about uh, what element is inside of another element. So honestly, CSS can be confusing. CSS can be tricky. It's like a puzzle piece. I've done this stuff for years, and oftentimes I still run into things that are tricky, and I have to look it up, and then um, play around with the code, and, and make mistakes, and then eventually fix it. Um, but honestly, CSS can be tricky. And at this point, it's not so bad. But as we get more complex, like when we get into jQuery Mobile, we're going to get uh, a lot of frustration here and there. But We'll usually be able to figure out the problem. Can we go back to where, um, 
Yes. Your first div is not working? No, it's still yellow. Alright, let's take a quick look. All right, so we got something called first div, and it's got a purple background. So let's get back to the concept of, okay, we've invented this ourselves, and I said we can use it multiple times per document. So let's see what I mean about that. Let's create a brand new div at the end, after second div. Let's create a third div in the HTML, in the content layer. So go over to, I've got the second div. Let's create another div, so line 47 or so, create a brand new div element. And I'm going to say, look at this third div. And I'm also, this is automatically then going to be yellow, because all divs become yellow but I want it to be purple, just like my first div. So I would just simply add that class. And now if you save it and run it, the third div will also be purple, like the first div. I just cho chose an arbitrary value, an arbitrary name, which wasn't the best name because it makes you think this will only apply to first divs. Uh, actually, this will apply to any div that is called first div. And so we write class equals first div. Remember, do not write the dot there. The dot is used when we're in the style block. So we've got a third div. It uses the same class as the first div, and therefore it's also purple and red like the first div. This is what I'm saying about classes can be used multiple times per document. This will make much more sense as we get more complex um, web apps and, and an Android app because we could have multiple screens of our app and we want various elements to all look the same. Well, we can use classes to make those different elements look the same on six different pages of our app. 
um, where perhaps we've used divs several times, but again, maybe one div out of three on every screen is going to look a certain way. And so if we also give them the attributes of, the, of, the, of a specific uh, class, they will all look the same. Scroll down to where? Yes, right. Tag, class, and ID. So we've played a little with class. Now let's contrast that with ID. ID also lets us invent our own sorts of tags and name them just about whatever we want within the rules. But the thing is that they can only be used once per document. And we'll see why that would be useful. You might think at one point it's limiting if you can only use it once per document, but sometimes we need to use it in order to target specific things or to work with specific things in our code. So an ID has similar syntax, but the big idea is that it's only used once per document. Right now I'm in the September 8th document. So we're going to create an ID, and we can only use it once in this document. But we can also use that same ID in the September 8th document, or another document. So what we'll do is we will create a fourth div. We'll write something in that div, and we will give it an ID with a brand new name. So if we go back to where we've got our divs, Let's create a brand new div. My fourth div of content. We will add an attribute to this tag. And the attribute is the ID. The ID attribute same sort of syntax. What's the attribute name equals something in quotes, double or single quotes. And so here we can make up an ID. This will be called, let's uh, be more specific here. I call the previous one first div, but, but that the name of that makes us think that it can only be used on the first div. I want to make a name here that makes a little bit more sense. Let's say this is the um, this is the welcome message. I might have a welcome message on different pages of my site. I want all welcome messages in my site to look the same. This will apply then to the welcome message on the first page.html, on the second page.html, on the third page.html. I only want one welcome message per page. I'm not going to have several welcome, pa se several welcome messages on one page. I want a welcome message once per page. Home page, about us page, contact page. So we've got a div with an ID. An ID can only be used once per document. Welcome message. Welcome MSG. We could have called it welcome message spelled out. Welcome MSG. So now we'll go back to we'll go back to our CSS block and now we're gonna say let's target anything called welcome message and because it's an ID we have to write it in the syntax of the of the pound symbol which is shift 3 the number sign the name of the ID that we invented, and then the same as before, curly braces and whatever rules we want to create, whatever properties and values we want to add to this selector.
So we get a gold background color to the fourth div. And in a sense, we can accomplish the exact same thing with a class, but as we get more complex, it will make more sense when to use a class and when to use an ID. Usually we use an ID because there's only one thing per document that we need to target or edit via CSS. And there can be multiple things per document that we can target with a class. Question? Why did you do one separate one? Because it's a separate selector. I've started a new selector here, so I put in a new one. I could, but then I, I want to add more, oh, okay. and then so I want them on separate lines. Yes. Well, let let me check your code in a moment. Let me check your code one moment, but just notice my syntax. I've got a div which is separate from another div. If, if this one div of yours is inside of another div, that's what will happen. So let me, let me look at your code, but here's what we've got so far. When you started with a comment here, you ended in here, you ended this here. When you started with a comment here, you ended in the same as before. You don't use an, you don't use an exclamation point. So the green is the comment, and then not green is regular code. So this is one of those tags that's odd. It doesn't end with an exclamation point. Let's see if that works. This, it still kind of behaved as normal, even though there were comments. Because well, you see this div right here? See this div right here? Sorry, the div and the slash that should be here. And this one. Um, well, yes. Select that ID equals code input, select it, and then we'll drag it into the line from the code. Is ID equal? Yes. Thank 
is the thing on the very first page. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've <clears throat> been dealing with CSS, embedded CSS, and we will get more complex as time goes on, of course. This is a big can of worms. HTML, the content layer, CSS, the presentation layer, and JavaScript, the behavior or interactivity level layer. Uh, all of those three languages come together to help us create our web app and then eventually our Android app. Um, so, again, it might not quite make sense, well, why did we use a class versus an ID? It'll make more sense as we get more complex. The big idea to, to remember is that IDs can only be used once per document and classes can be used multiple times. If you try to reuse this ID, you may get weird results. I'm not saying that your computer will freeze up and that sort of thing if you try to reuse an ID. I'm just saying it's not going to work as expected. So if I try to give the second div the same ID, you know, it's going to let me write it, but it doesn't mean it's going to end up the way that I think it does. They both do look gold like I think, but actually if I look, you know, if, if I look inside of my my debugger and such, I might get, I might get um, feedback that there's something wrong. And with such a simple project, I might not really see a difference, but you have to believe me. IDs, you only want to use them once per document. Even though it let me, even though it seems like it works, when we get more complex, this will have much more problems. So we'll just ignore that. Now let's say here, I am writing some CSS to affect this whole block, a div or a, a UL or whatever. Let's say I want to target now even deeper. I want to target just the word div to be different. If I wanted div, the word div to stand out to be different, every time I use it in my, every time I see it in my document, would I use an ID or a class? A class. That's what I said earlier. You want to use a class when something is going to be reused multiple times per document. The word div appears multiple times. Therefore, I want to target it with a class. So now let's try that. I want to make the word div be different. The, the word div uh, be controlled via CSS. So we saw that we've got this div tag and the div tag is used as a container, a generic container, but the div class is best used for large amounts of content. We want to target small amounts of content. We have another kind of generic container that will let us do this, and I'll talk about the differences a bit more in a moment. But we've got div, and we've got another tag called span, S-P-A-N. So what I want, I want to do at this moment, I want to add the span tag to every instance of div. So I'll start first on line 45, where I've got my first div, and the span tag does have a pair. So find where you wrote this is a div, write the span tags around that div, And do the same thing for the second, third, and fourth divs. If you wrote some other words, no problem. Just write a span, wrap the span tag around different words in your divs.
remember what I said about double clicking or uh, selecting uh, code in Notepad, it'll then highlight everywhere that it appears. So I'm just confirming here. I wrote the span tag slash span, don't forget that, span slash span around this div word and this div word and that div word and that one. Not on the div tag, that'll be havoc. You just want to write it around the word div that we wrote in the sentence. So yes, we had to write the span pair four times. Once that's done, we go back up to our CSS, create a new selector for spans, and now all four of those will automatically change. All 40 of those, all 400 of those. So it does need that first setup of using a tag or an ID or a class on some element. Once that's done, you write a CSS selector and then everything that has that selector gets styled. So I've written those spans. I'll go back to the CSS and after my welcome message ID, this is a, a span is just a regular tag. So it does not need a, it does not need a dot, it does not need a, a, a pound symbol, it's just span. It's a tag. And I'm just reusing over and over background color because it's one of the most obvious things we can use, but in this case I will write text color. Oops, black. So logically here I'm saying anywhere that there is a span tag in this document, give it a background color of white and a text color of black. I've used a the CSS tag selector. So anywhere that tag exists in this document, it could be once, it could be 100 times. Apply the span style. My class was with the dot. Anytime that there is something class equals that, apply the class. And then the ID is anywhere one time in the document that its ID equals this, apply this style. Try that. Save it and launch it, and hopefully all those words div um, inherit the white background, black text color. Did you write here semicolon and on the next line color colon black? So did everyone get black text white background? Here, um, span and span <coughs> and begin with slash. So slash and slash span and slash span. Because <coughs> we're starting a tag and closing a tag. So now it turns purple to recognize that we've started a tag and stopped. Um, let's see. 
Okay, so um, all instances of the word div inherited this style. We used a span. Well, you say, well, why didn't we use a div? A div is known as a block level element, so it's really about affecting a whole block of content. If it was a whole paragraph or uh, a picture or a large group of content, the div is best for uh, a block, a group of of content. Um, and a span is an inline level element. It's best for pieces, things that are in another element. So this whole thing, this whole purple thing is a block, and this yellow thing is a block, and this other one's another block, and this is a block. These are all blocks. So the 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 div tag over here, let's make some notes down here, difference between div and span. block level element or a group of content and span inline level element for individual or for content in content. So something inside of something. Um, you know, this this is an inline element. The word level is an inline element, and the block is this whole line. So the whole line right here could be a div, but then the span is just the word level. Or it could be level element. And it doesn't literally need to be one word, but it, it could be level element that could have a span wrapping around it. And, and uh, the big idea is that if we try to put in a div, wrapping around the word div in, in that block, suddenly you've put a block inside of a block and your results may look very odd. So this goes back to the concept that um, we have, have you heard of um, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place? So that's kind of the idea here in that we have the right tag for the right task. Uh, the span tag has a specific task or, or purpose. It's to, it's to control um, inline elements, something inside of something else. And div has a, an, a meaning or a use. Uh, the task for that tag is for, the, for a whole block of content. It's block level. And span is inline level. Yes? Does span have to come within a div? No, a span could um, be in a p tag. A span could be in a paragraph. The paragraph itself is a kind of a block level element. So you don't need a span literally in a div, but a span could be in a p tag. We've also got an address tag. We could do that. We've got a, something called a pre tag. So spans are usually inside of other larger tags. 
And technically, you could have a div inside of a div, but that's if you know what you're doing. Like if we're going to have a left column and a right column, those could be two divs inside of a larger div. That's more complex. So this is a big can of worms. We'll, we'll hopefully make more sense as we go on. But the big idea here is after playing with a little bit of content, the, uh, the content layer, the HTML <coughs> aspect, now we're playing a lot with CSS. That's the, uh, the presentation layer, the style aspect, the style language. So any questions so far? We'll get more complex, of course, but let's introduce well, let's take a break. Um, let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll introduce a little bit of JavaScript, the third aspect of the third pillar of our project. We've been coding for about an hour now. So after I'm done talking during the break is the perfect time to print because that printer is noisy. But uh, what we're going to do uh, is take a 10-minute break. It's about 8.33. When we come back at 8.43, We'll continue to work, and now we'll look at some JavaScript. So if you need any help, call me over, and we'll get it working.